Well, the assignment that has been given to me for this session is to preach on Trinitarian worship, which is a lot to get your arms around, and I hope you'll not be disappointed because in order to do that, I would have to cover more territory than I have time allotted. And so what I want to do is focus upon worship at its best, worship that is in heaven, that is, as it is found in Revelation chapter 4, as it is focused upon God the Father. So if you have your Bibles, and I'm sure that you do, if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4. I want to begin reading, I want to begin by reading the first uh, eight verses of this text, and I think that you'll see why I have selected this text for this session at this time to direct our thoughts in the worship that most pleases God. And ultimately, that is the issue. It's not the issue that pleases us. It is not the, it's not the worship that will attract the world. It is the worship that is most pleasing to God. That is our desire. And so in Revelation chapter 4, I want to begin reading in verse 1, and I want to set the text before you that we will be considering in this session. We talked last night about biblical preaching. You read the text, you explain the text, you apply the text. So let me begin by reading the text. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the fourth living… and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, holy holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. A new way of doing church has emerged across the country, one that is virtually unprecedented in the history of the church. It is a new way that is taking its cues from the world. The goal seems to be to make Sunday morning the gathering of the church as much like the world as possible. This radical paradigm shift has come about with the goal in mind of attracting the world. So whatever will make an unconverted attender most comfortable in church is what the worship service is designed to do. A new atmosphere is desired. A new ambiance is designed. The idea now is to be comfortable in worship, to be casual, uh, to be laid back, 
uh, to be kicked back. Uh, the goal is to be cool and cutting edge, certainly not timeless and transcendent. Uh, the emphasis is no longer upon reverence, but upon being relaxed. Now, the music has changed too, and it's either very soft and soothing or so jamming and jiving that the words are virtually unintelligible. All too often, the preaching is different as well. And no longer is expositional preaching the goal. Instead, the preacher wants to be trendy, light, chatty, brief, felt need oriented. He desires to be far more therapeutic than theological. And the dress is different too. And rather than coming to church as though you were having an audience with the king, now the desire to be is, it seems to be as sloppy as possible. And the desire is to, to look as though you just fell out of bed. In order to have an audience with yourself, the infinite has been replaced with the informal. Exposition has been re replaced with entertainment. The vertical has been replaced with the horizontal. The transcendent with the trendy and trivial. A doctrine has been replaced with drama. And all of this is to remove the barriers between the church and the world and to make the church as attractive to the world as it can possibly be. And that is to become like the world in order to win the world. But there is an utter bankruptcy to this approach. Uh, rather than looking around at the world in order to pa fashion our worship service, uh, the church is looking in the wrong direction. Uh, the church needs to be looking up to heaven, where the best worship is, where God has designed the worship service in heaven. And our worship on the earth needs to be but a little slice of heaven. It needs to be a foretaste of heaven. Our worship upon the earth needs to be as much like the worship of heaven as it can possibly be. R.C. Sproul has written a book in, entitled, A Taste of Heaven, and it is a book about worship. And in this book, Sproul argues convincingly that all worship on the earth should be anticipatory of heaven and should be a foretaste of heaven in which the worshiper has some sense that I have already tasted of heaven long before I go to heaven and that the worship here upon the earth would be in some way to prepare me for the very worship of heaven itself. Sproul then asks this question, if God Himself were to design worship, what would it look like? The answer to that question is found in Revelation chapter 4. The answer to that question is found in the Word of God. And so this morning, I want us to look into this text of Scripture, into the most perfect worship service that there is. This one which is designed by God. And I want us to note what are its distinctives, what is its tone, what is its feel. And in order to look at this section, I, I want to begin by setting the stage. I want us to look at verse 1 just for a moment. Now, just to set the stage, after these things, referring to after the vision of Christ on Patmos in chapter 1, and after the seven letters to the seven churches, in chapters 2 and 3, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. And the apostle John has been on the island of Patmos when suddenly he is in the Spirit on the Lord's day. 
And he is now commanded by Christ himself to come up to heaven, and as the Apostle John does, he steps into a worship service, a worship service that is already going on. And what does John experience? What does John see? What does John hear? What does John feel? I want to set several distinctives before you from this text and submit to you that our worship services upon the earth must bear the mark of these five distinctives. Distinctive number one, a high view of God. A high view of God in verses two through four. As John stepped into heaven, he stepped into this worship service that is already in progress. And first and foremost, it was designed to convey and to communicate the exaltation and the magnification of God Himself. Verse 2, immediately. In other words, this struck John instantly as he stepped into this service. He knows he's in another world. He knows that he is in another place. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. The first thing that struck John about heaven was not who is there and who is not there. The first thing that struck John was not to have a Q&A to have all of his questions answered. And the first thing that struck John was not the streets of gold or the gates of pearl. The first note that struck John is a throne. The throne is, represents the absolute sovereignty of Almighty God. Uh, this throne that is towering over all of human history, this tower, this throne that is over every human life, and that is over every human destiny. It is this throne that immediately grabs John's attention. His focus is instantly dominated by an awareness of the supreme authority and absolute sovereignty of God. That is the dominant theme of heaven, and that is the dominant theme of this worship service. And John needs to be reminded of this, because down here on the earth, the Apostle John has been suffering exile and suffering persecution, and it would appear at this moment in history that Caesar of Rome is ruling and reigning over history's darkest hour. It would have appeared from John's earthly perspective that the enemies of the gospel were ruling and that circumstances were ruling and that man and devils were ruling. But upon stepping into this worship service, there is an immediate change of perspective. And what John sees is that it is not Caesar, it is not Satan, it is not man, it is not circumstances, it is not any fictitious uh, myth of good luck or chance or fate, but that there is a throne in heaven. And the one who is seated upon this throne is ruling and reigning. He says the throne was standing in heaven. That it is standing means that it is fixed. It is bolted to the floor. It is permanent. It is unshakable. It is immovable. It is unchanging. It is unswayed by human leaders. It is unaltered by human events. It is standing. Caesars come and they go, but this throne remains standing. Human history ebbs and flows, but this throne remains fixed, towering over all of the universe. And then John records, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. This throne is occupied. It is not in a vacated throne. It is not an empty throne. God has permanently assumed this posture of sitting upon the throne, and the throne will never be abdicated. God is presiding, and God is ruling, 
and God is reigning every moment of every day, and this dominates the inner sanctum of heaven. In fact, everything in heaven in this chapter is viewed in its relationship to the throne. In verse 2, he notes the one on the throne. In verse 4, he notes those who are around the throne. In verse 5, that which is proceeding from the throne. In verse 6, that which is before the throne. In verse 6, that which is in and around the throne. In verse 9, it is that which is to the throne. In verse 10, it is that which is before the throne. Everything in heaven is measured by its proximity to the throne, whether it is above the throne, below the throne, around the throne, next to the throne. The throne is the epicenter of all that there is, and it is God who is upon this throne. The Apostle John does not name who this one is who is on the throne. He does not need to because it is so blatantly obvious. It is none other than the sovereign God of heaven and earth, the one who but speaks and it is done, the one who acts and it holds fast, the one who wills and it is done. In verse 3, something of His glory, something of His radiant, shining glory is bursting forth inside this throne room. And He who is sitting was like a jasper stone that speaks of the crystal clear diamond, speaks of His purity, speaks of His holiness, speaks of His glory. And there is a shining forth of the radiant glory of God that is bursting forth from this jasper stone. And a sardius in appearance, comforting, beautiful, beautiful in His holiness. And there was a rainbow around the throne, no doubt representing His covenant faithfulness to His people. And there was an emerald in appearance. All of the beauty of these valuable stones representing something of the perfections and the attributes and the character and the being and the glory and the majesty of Almighty God as John is staring into this throne room. It speaks of the regal and royal majesty of God, His stately splendor. It is a vivid display of His awesome glory. Whenever anyone enters into our worship services, they should not be struck with the horizontal, they should be struck with the vertical. They should not be struck with our adaptability to the world. They should be struck with our identity with Almighty God and this throne and the one who is seated upon this throne, the one who is ruling and reigning, reigning over all of history. In verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones. And these are lesser thrones under the direction of the one great central throne of God. These are, if you will, appellate thrones. These are subordinate thrones. They possess a delegated authority to rule and reign with God, but under God. And we read that upon these thrones are the 24 elders representing the redeemed of the saints from all of the ages, perhaps twelve elders of Old Testament saints and twelve elders of New Testament saints, but no doubt representing all of the redeemed of all of the ages, the one people of God, and these elders presiding under the supreme authority of God. They are clothed in white garments. It matters how they are dressed. They represent, these garments represent the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to them in the act of justification. They stand faultless and blameless before the very throne of God, not due to their own works of righteousness, but because of the perfect righteousness of Him who lived a sinless and perfect life and bore our sins upon Calvary's cross. 
and golden crowns on their heads. It's the victor's crown rewarded to those who have persevered in ministry and in life. And there is this note of triumph. There is this note of of victory in this worship service as these who now share in the righteousness of Christ share in His victory and share in the triumph of His glorious exaltation. No, there is no sense of defeat in this worship service, but simply the magnification of the supreme will of God and the glory of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is at the very forefront of a God-centered worship service. It is throne-centered. It is sovereignty-centered. This is what people should sense and feel as they enter into our worship services that I have left the world behind and I have stepped into another world. I have stepped into the world to come. Heaven has come down and I have stepped into the presence of the King. There should be this overriding sense of the towering transcendence of God over us and His supreme sovereignty. Now, in order for this to happen, we must be going down deep into the Word of God if we are to be lifted up to the heights of heaven. It is the depth of our worship service in the ministry of the Word that will determine the height of our worship. And if we are superficial in the ministry of the Word of God, then our worship of God will be equally superficial. But only as there is a depth in our digging down into the Word of God, it is our depth that will determine our height. John MacArthur has told me, I can walk into a church where I am to preach, and I can tell you within five minutes of listening to the music, what is the level of commitment to the ministry of the Word of God in this church? And where there is faithful teaching and preaching of the Word of God that goes down into the deep veins of the sovereign grace of God and mined out of the glorious reservoirs of Scripture, then the people rise up to the heights of heaven's throne and bless His name. But when man is the preoccupation, when the world is being courted, when, when we have such a, a low ceiling in the ministry of the Word of God, then the worship of God is very low. As we step into the worship service of God, there must be this sense that we have left the realm where Satan reigns, where sin reigns, where demons reign. And we have entered into the heavenly realm where God alone reigns. Do you feel this as you walk into your worship service? This high view of God, this towering view of God, when you are alone with God and you have an open Bible and you come before the Lord, is this the sense that you have that I am entering into the throne room of God? And I am coming before the one who is seated upon this throne through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I now have an audience with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That I need to sit up straight. That I need to pay attention. That I need to lean forward. That I need to humble myself. That I need to look upward into the heights of heaven. This is the first distinctive of this worship service, a high view of God. And may I say to you, you cannot have too high of a view of God. You will never outpunch your coverage in this. Behold your God. Now, second, there needs to be a deep fear of God. 
a high view of God and a deep fear of God. And it is the high view of God that produces the deep fear of God. And so we read now in verse 5, and please note the tone of this worship service. It is one that is marked by reverence and awe. There is a sense of shock and awe about this worship service. This is not like you're stepping into to Starbucks and hearing a little mood music in the background. Suddenly, the one in this scene is gripped with the awesome reality of entering into the presence of Almighty God, and there is a deep fear of God. Notice verse 5, out from the throne, meaning proceeding out of the very character and being of God, come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. There is nothing soft and gentle about this scene. Here are flashes of lightning and peals of thunder and lamps of fire from this throne. Here is the thundering, fiery presence of God totally controlling John's attention. The tone is strong. It is masculine. It is dominant. This is intended to reflect the supreme authority of God. There is no one going up to the throne and high-fiving God. There is no one casual with God in this setting. There is no one trying to be cool. Not with this lightning and thunder proceeding from the throne of God. This is intended to do something to the worshiper, and it is intended to instill a healthy, holy, reverential awe and fear of Almighty God. This tone is, it's dominant, it is riveting, it is commanding, it is compelling. Now, unlike so many worship services today where it seems that the goal in today's setting is intended to do everything it can to remove the fear of God. Everything is to be casual and and comfy and sweet and sappy and, and syrupy. And as John MacArthur says, and I agree, we are suffering from the feminization of the church. Men are to be men and women are to be women, but the scene has become far too soft and cuddly, but not in this worship service, not in this scene. It strikes a note of sobriety and seriousness in the heart of those who are there. It is attention-grabbing. It is arresting. It is not toned down to make people feel comfortable. It is thunderous. And it is intended to convey the awesomeness of Almighty God. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and so it is in the beginning of worship. Psalm 2 verse 11 says, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoicing with trembling. Psalm 5, verse 7 says, at your holy temple, I will bow in reverence before you. That is to say, the worshiper is to take God very seriously and to realize that I am standing on His earth, I am breathing His air, I am drinking His water, and I am living the defined parameters of a lifespan that He has set before me. There is this deep fear and reverence for God. We are a generation that has lost this sense of the fear of God. Do you see yourself growing in the fear of God? At the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, this is the entire matter. 
Fear God and keep His commandments. It's not just the beginning of wisdom, it's the end of wisdom and everything in between. We should be growing in our reverential respect and honor for God as we grow in His grace. Third, a distinct separation from God. In verses 6 through 8, what is conveyed to us by John as he has stepped into this worship service is that even in heaven, God alone remains God, and even we as glorified saints remain but glorified creatures, and that there is a vast expanse, a a sea of glass that still sets off God from His creatures. In verse 6, and before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like, like crystal, this vast expanse separating God from the redeemed saints. The Scripture says we shall behold His face. Now, the Scripture says that we will sit on the throne with Christ and rule and reign with Him. But this text also says that there will be forever this sea of glass-like crystal between God and us, this sea of glass shining brilliantly, sparkling brightly. And when we come to the end of Revelation 21, we read that there is no more sun, and there is no reason for the sun because of the bright shining glory of God Himself and the effulgence of His divine perfections will illuminate and light up the entire universe and it will be refracted and shining through this sea of glass, magnifying its brilliance. And as we stand in the presence of the Lord, He will be shining brighter than 10,000 suns before us. And in that day in our glorified body that will be perfectly adapted for our new heavenly home, we will be in a glorified body that will be able to look upon His face, the beatific vision. and honor and glorify Him. And verse 6 says, and in the center and around the throne, meaning at each corner of the throne. Again, I would draw to your attention that everything is defined by the throne. That is the epicenter of the universe that God has created. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, literally in the Greek, four living ones. Now, these four living ones, I think, are cherubim. Ezekiel 10, verse 15, identifies them as cherubim, an exalted order of angelic beings whose primary responsibility are to be guardians of the glory of God. In Genesis 3, verse 24, these cherubim were positioned at the entrance to the Garden of Eden, keeping an Adam, keeping Adam and Eve from, from returning. In 1 Kings 6, verse 23 and 28, there are two carved cherubim placed in in the Holy of Holies symbolically representing their guardianship of God's holiness. And in Ezekiel 28, 14 and 16, we read that Satan was once the anointed cherub, that one which was closest to the throne of God. No one approaches the throne in any attempted coup or takeover, but that they would have to pass through these cherubim. I believe it's merely symbolic and representative for who could remove God from His throne, but it is there as they are there as a visual reminder to us that God is set apart and that God is separated even from His glorified creatures. We read in verse 6, they are full of eyes in front and behind. That is their constant surveillance, looking in every direction, seeing in front and behind and all sides. No one is allowed to approach the throne without their awareness. They are in constant vigil. They are alert. They are awake. And in verse 7, the first creature was like 
a lion, the second like a calf, the third like a man, the fourth like an eagle, certainly reflecting what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 1, like a lion, strong in serving God, a calf, sacrificial in its service, like a man, smart, reasoning, brilliant in service for God, like an eagle, swift to fly off to carry out the Master's bidding. And the four living creatures, verse 8, each one of them having six wings, no doubt drawn from Isaiah chapter 6, and the seraphim also having six wings. We read there, with two to cover their face, unable that close to the throne of God to gaze upon His blinding glory with two wings covering their eyes with two covering their feet, a sense of their utter unworthiness to be in the presence of one who is so infinitely holy, and with two wings they flew, ready to dart off into the universe to carry out the will of the one upon the throne. It certainly says something about how we are to be as well in our service of God, ready to go serve the Lord, a sense of our own unworthiness in ourself, but strong and sacrificial in our commitment to this God. And we read, and day and night, day and night, day and night, at the end of verse 8, they do not cease to say, they have this lifestyle of worship, this continuous, ongoing a commitment and focus towards God. They are crying out, holy, holy, holy. The same threefold repetition that we read in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. This epiphany of praise back and forth, volleying back and forth from both sides of the throne to the other, holy, holy, holy. This attribute being the only attribute singled out in the worship of God, the holiness of God, the summation of all that God is, all of His perfections and all of His divine attributes, the wholeness of God in His holiness, speaks of His utter and complete separation from His creation, that He is a cut above us, that He is majestic and transcendent and high and lifted up, set apart from all evil without any moral blemish of sin. All of His ways are perfect. All of His words are perfect. All of His works are perfect. All of His judgments are perfect, never erring repeated three times to indicate the superlative degree, holy, holier, holiest, God completely distinct from all other beings, and completely and utterly sinless and pure, separate, separate, separate. Sinless, sinless, sinless. This is to be the sense. This is the air that we are to breathe in the worship service, that we are like Moses before the burning bush, and we now stand on holy ground. 1 Samuel 2, verse 2, there is no one holy like the Lord. Exodus 15, 11, God alone is majestic in holiness. Habakkuk 1, verse 13, His eyes are too pure to approve evil, and He cannot look on wickedness with favor. Psalm 47, verse 8, God sits on His holy throne. Leviticus 11, verse 44, I am the Lord your God. I am holy. This should set a guard on every worship service upon this earth. 
Everything that does not pass through this paradigm of the holiness of God should be left at the front door. No place for triviality, no place for verbality, no place for, for the arrogance of man, no place for the secular ideologies of this world and the worship service of Him who is infinitely and absolutely, perfectly, eternally holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the sovereign ruler who possesses supreme authority. Kyrios is the Lord God, the Almighty. This is the strongest name that God can take for Himself. He is almighty. There is no strength but the Lord's strength. There is no might, there is no power, but that it is the Lord's power. The power that you and I have to live our little moments in the sun is but a delegated power that has come to us from God. It is in Him that we live and move and have our being. But all power and all might belong to our God alone. Nothing is impossible for our God. There can be no resistance that will ever succeed against our God when He makes His arm bare in the day of His power. God possesses creating power to speak everything into being out of nothing. He has sustaining power to uphold all that He has made. He possesses governing power to providentially rule over all circumstances and events. He has saving power to rescue the chief of sinners. He has judging power to damn that which falls short of His glory. Psalm 115, verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. Heaven is not run by a democracy. Heaven is not run by anything but a theocracy. I hear some say, well, God votes for you and the devil votes against you and you have the deciding vote. Well, let me tell you, the devil doesn't have a vote. The devil is, as Martin Luther said, the devil is God's devil. And God will use him to carry out his own purposes here upon the earth. No, heaven is ruled by the theocracy of God. The angels go on to say, who was and who is and who is to come, this too should, should, should dominate our, our worship services that this God is transcendent above time. He's not trendy. He is above time. He is the God of eternity from everlasting to everlasting God is God. That God was speaks to His eternality. That God is speaks to His immutability. And He is to come. He is without beginning. He is the uncreated Creator. He is the first cause of which everything and everyone is the subsequent effect. Psalm 93 verse 2, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That is what this is representing, this towering, eternal, timeless transcendence of God over all that there is. 1 Timothy 1, 17, now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, he is the uncreated creator without beginning, free from the succession of time. And this God who was is the God who is, meaning there is no alteration, there is no changing, never weakening, never diminishing, never tiring, never increasing, forever the same. Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. James 1, 17, the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Psalm 102, of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. 
And all of them will wear out like garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. No, God is not on our level. Neither are we on His level. We have union and communion with Christ, and His mediation has brought us before this throne of grace. But let us remember the one before whom we come in our worship, the one who was and who is and who shall be forever, who is holy, 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 who is the Lord God, the Almighty. A.W. Tozier said, the most important thing about your life is what comes into your mind when you think of God, that everything in your life is a subsequent effect of this one central knowledge of God. That is why Calvin began his institutes with the knowledge of God and the knowledge of man, knowing that everything in my life flows from my knowledge of God, and even my knowledge of self flows from my knowledge of God. And a high view of God will lead to high worship and high and holy living, and low views of God will lead to to low living in the gutter. My view of God is that pivot point in my life that affects all that I am and all that I do. The greatest thing that can happen in your worship service It's for there to be the unveiling of the greatness and the glory and the grandeur of God. Number four, in verse 9 and 10, a constant focus upon God. Every sight line in this scene is intersecting in God. Every anthem of praise is being directed towards God. It is, it is all about God. It is all going to God. At verse 9, and when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever. Notice the emphasis on Him. And in verse 10, the 24 elders will fall down before Him and will worship Him. Everything is about Him in this worship service. These worshipers are lost in the glory of Him, glory to Him, honor to Him, thanks to Him, falling down before Him, casting crowns before Him. Everything has this Godward focus, this Godward preoccupation, this Godward orientation. God is the focal point. First Chronicles 29, verses 11 and 12, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on the earth. Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and You exalt Yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from You, and You rule over all. And in Your hand is power and might, and it lies in Your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank You and praise Your glorious name. Worship is all about getting the first person out of the way, and the second person in, getting the I out and the you in, in worship. In verse 10, the 24 elders will fall down before Him who sits on the throne. They they fall like cut timber before His throne of grace again and again. In fact, six times in the book of Revelation, these elders are prostrating themselves before the throne of God. It is a humble posture of reverential awe and lowering oneself in the presence of Him who is infinitely greater than they are. And they will worship Him who lives forever and ever And I love this at the end of verse 10, and will cast their crowns before the throne. You know what this signifies? 
It signifies that from Him and through Him and now to Him are all things. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. They come to the realization, no doubt, that I cannot keep this crown. God, it is you who chose me in eternity past for yourself. It is you who predestined my eternal salvation. It is you who sent your Son to die for me. It is you who sent your Spirit to regenerate me when I was dead in trespasses and sin. It was you who convicted me of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It is you who called me out of darkness into light. It is you who drew me irresistibly to yourself. It is you who birthed me into your kingdom. It is you who have come to indwell within me. It is you who has at work within me, both to will and to work for, his, for your good pleasure. It is you who has empowered me for every good work. It is you who have prepared all good works for me to walk in. It is you who has done all of this, and it is you who has safely brought me all the way home to glory before your throne of grace. I cannot keep this crown. I am what I am by the grace of God. This crown belongs to you, God. All things are from you and through you and to you. I cast this crown before your throne of grace, in, in, uh, representative and symbolic of my worship of you, that all that I am, I am by your grace. This is the worship service in heaven. Listen, I'm in some churches where I preach, and the pastor is more excited for the announcements <laughs> than he is for God. Our preaching is to exalt His name. Our, our teaching is to magnify His grace. Our worship must be directed exclusively to Him. So law needs to be put back in our worship for the glory of God alone. And then finally, verse 11, this towering anthem of praise just sitting here at the end of the chapter, or in the middle of the chapter, a resounding praise to God. You know what the word praise means? In the Hebrew, it means to, to boast in God, to brag on God to exalt God, to magnify God, to glory in God. And such high theology now demands this high doxology. The higher our theology, the higher our doxology. This can be now the only expression from hearts of those who have come to understand the sovereign grace of our God. Worthy are you. Our worship is declaring the worthiness of God, that He alone is worthy to receive our praise. He alone is worthy to receive all that I am and all that I have be given to Him. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory. Now, just stop right there. Theologians make a distinction between two aspects of glory. There is God's intrinsic glory, and there is ascribed glory. God's intrinsic glory is all that God is, all of His divine attributes, all of His divine being, all of His divine perfections, the sum and the substance of the person of God. And there is no way that any of us here today can add to that glory, and we cannot take from that glory. God is who God is, unchanging in His eternal perfections. That is God's intrinsic glory. And then there is ascribed glory. This is the glory that we give to God. This is the glory that we declare to the nations and the glory that we declare to God. And the more we understand of His intrinsic glory, the more we will ascribe glory to Him. 
The more that the veil is pulled back and we understand from the depths of Scripture something of the height and depth and breadth and length of the glory of this God, the more we are overwhelmed in astonishment and awe and want to now ascribe glory to this God. That is what we see in verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory, to receive this ascribed glory based upon the revelation and the knowledge of His intrinsic glory that was made known in the anthem, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, heaven and earth is full of your glory. And now all of heaven resounds in praise to God as they now apprehend and come to understand with increasing awareness the majesty and the transcendence of this awesome God to receive. You are so worthy to receive our ascribed glory and honor. We honor You and exalt You and esteem You and power. We cannot give power to God. This is a part of His intrinsic glory. So, in this verse, we have both intrinsic and ascribed glory. For you created all things. You spoke everything into being out of nothing. You stood at the beginning and declared the end. You spoke from eternity past. You are the author of your eternal decree. You have never resorted to plan B or to plan C or to plan Z to whatever exponential power. You have had one plan A from all of eternity past, and it encompasses all that has come to be. You have spoken, and it has come to be. And because of your will, because of your free will, because of your sovereign will, they existed and were created. What a worship service this is. As John has been on the island of Patmos and is suddenly cut up, caught up in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and a door opened in heaven, and he hears the voice come up, and he is in his Spirit taken to heaven, and He enters into the very throne room of God and beholds all of this. This is what our worship service should be like. This is what our personal and private devotion should be like, that we are coming before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is now our Father and who has birthed us into His kingdom and has adopted us as His sons, and we have throne rights to come before His throne of grace through the mediatorial work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of His Holy Spirit, we come before His throne of grace. Let us have a high view of God. Let us have deep fear of God. Let us give resounding praise to this God, and let us remember that He is forever God, and we are the people and the sheep of His pasture, bought with a great price, glorified in His Son. All praise and all glory to Him. As you worship the Lord, therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be renewed in your mind and be transformed that you may prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. May you give to God your very body, your mind, your heart, your soul from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. May you be sold out to this God 
And may your life be a living and holy sacrifice to Him.